one of the ways that you come up with truth from the political level is essentially through a Darwinian process. You know, if you really want to solve a complicated problem, maybe you try to solve it a hundred ways and then you take the best solution. And look, this happens to entrepreneurs all the time too, you know, like most entrepreneurs, this is something to know, well, most entrepreneurs, most creative people fail at producing their creative product and monetizing it, right? So your default position, if you're a creative person, is you're gonna fail. And so, and that's because it's hard to come up with something new and it's hard to present it to the market at the right time and it's hard to market it. Like those things are really, really difficult. And so what successful entrepreneurs do is they just keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And eventually, if they're fortunate, one of their ideas happens to hit the right place at the right time. And so that's also Darwinian in some sense. You know, you're creating all these little enterprises that are sort of alive. They're run by people after all. And even if your idea is good, that doesn't mean it will be successful. There's so many things that have to be taken into account. So this is partly why persistence and that's part of conscientiousness is so useful. It's like, you know, what do they say? If, if at first you fail, then try, try again. And, and that would probably mean try something different rather than the same thing. But Persistence is helpful because it enables you to run many, many experiments. And you need to know that the baseline is failure. You know, it's important because otherwise you'll blame that on yourself. You know, and, and some of that's useful because there's probably some things that you could improve about yourself. But it's very difficult to go from zero to one, you know. If you're starting out as a salesperson, for example, the hardest sale is the first customer. And then, you know, they get easier with each additional customer. The first thing I think you need to understand is that these people that you're comparing yourself to, you don't really know very well. What that means is that you see their shiny outside, but you don't see the reality of their life. You know, maybe you're in California, see someone speeding down the road in a convertible Porsche, and you think, oh man, what a lucky bastard. And the truth of the matter is that he's thinking about wrapping his expensive sports car around the next cement pillar that he comes close to. You know, you, you can't tell. And, People have hard lives, and even people who are comparatively fortunate have hard lives. And so the ideal that you're observing that makes you jealous and resentful is in large part an illusion that's created by your own mind. You know, I, I can give you just one example. It's like I know a fair number of extremely wealthy people, and most of them, most of the people I happen to know are people who've made them, their money themselves. And I tell you, man, they have a burden of responsibility that would crush me, would crush the typical person. They're just working flat out, like 90 hours a week, and they have thousands of people depending on them. And, you know, they have their money, and they have their status, and that's not nothing. But don't be thinking that there isn't a price to be paid for that. You know, they don't see their families, they're often divorced, they don't see their children grow up, and they don't have time off. Now, there are wealthy playboy types, I suppose, who live out the dreams of wealth of a foolish 14-year-old, but they're not that common, and you have to be careful of what you're jealous of because you don't really know what it is. And then the other thing that's kind of useful is to, well, to understand that you're different from everyone else. And this is especially true as you get older. When you're 17 or 16 or something like that, comparing yourself to other people makes a certain amount of sense because 16 and 17 year olds, they're kind of the same, you know, which is why when you go off to university, you can make friends so quickly. It's like, I'm just about 60. It takes me like 15 years to make a friend now, you know, um, as opposed to the two months that it took when I was 17 you're quite different from other people and you shouldn't be comparing yourself to them because they're not like you, you know? They don't have your family. They don't have your temperament. They don't have your troubles. They don't have your abilities. The only person that has those is you. And this is why one of the rules, I think it's rule four, is compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. See, that's a game you can win because you could be a little better today than you were yesterday. And that's a good thing. You're a little better. That, that's a good thing. And, and, you know, no doubt there are some things that you could improve. You know, if you, if you sit and meditate for any length of time about what you're not doing optimally, answers will spring to mind. You know, you could be getting up earlier. You could be watching YouTube less, unless they're my videos, in which case you could be watching them more. <laughs> Comparing yourself to who you are now, that's a game you can win. And, like I've seen this be effective in many, many cases in my clinical practice, for example. It's like you take stock of where you are, you know, what your advantages are and what your disadvantages are, and then you start with a little humility 
on the path of incremental improvement. And, you know, incremental improvement compounds. And so you can get a long ways. And you see, because trajectory in some sense is more important than position for human beings. I mean, if you're starving to death, that, that's not the situation that I'm describing. But, you know, if you've got the bare necessities of life and so you're not, you're not surrounded by absolute privation, what you really want is to see that you're on an uphill path, you know, something that's got the right slope. And you can start anywhere on that path. And you can improve half a percent a day or a quarter of a percent a day. And you think, well, that's not very much. It's like, it's a hundred percent. If it's a quarter of a percent a day, it's a hundred percent in four years. And that doesn't count compounding, you know, which means it's really going to happen a lot faster. I think that the possibility that you can make yourself slightly better on a continual basis is, I think that's something that's accessible to everyone. I, I think that's equivalent to leading a virtuous life. And, you know, I talked about the terrible catastrophe in some sense of differences in intelligence and differences in conscientiousness and so forth and the downside of the meritocracy. But there is something to be said for virtue and truth. You know, and, and that is one thing, another thing that I've noticed about people who've been phenomenally successful is that they really do everything they can to live a truthful life. And that, you can get a bloody long ways by being honest. It's really something. And so, 